welcome everyone to today's webinar, Intersecting Systems and the Needs of Families, Family Law, Child Protection and Domestic Violence. My name's Dr. Ray Kaspiev. I'm the Research Director, Systems and Services here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I would like to start with an acknowledgement of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional lands, as the traditional owners of the lands I'm speaking from today on the banks of the beautiful Birrarung River. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Last fortnight, APES held its biennial conference where we considered the theme, putting families at the center from a range of different perspectives. The topic of this webinar was one of the panels presented. As not everyone could attend, and this is very important subject matter, we decided to give you a taste of the conference and provide an opportunity to focus our discussion to the questions that you, the audience here today, have on this topic. The panellists all agreed to participate in, in this webinar and we're very grateful to them for that. So I'm thrilled to welcome again our four very eminent panellists. Lisa O'Neill, Senior Judicial Registrar of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. Anne Holl Hollands, the National Children's Commissioner. Professor Darrell Higgins, Director of the Institute of Child Protection Studies at the Australian Catholic University. And finally, but not least, we have Jess Hill, an investigative journalist who has done a significant amount of work to place focus on the issue of family violence. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. We are going to play an edited version of the discussion that we had at the AFES conference. The full panel will be available on the AFES website in the coming week. But before we do that, I want to set the scene. But the family law team at the Australian Institute of Family Studies recently completed a project that was funded by Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety. It was a project that looked at compliance with and enforcement of family law parenting orders. We looked at 300 files involving matters that went to contravention applications. So that's the pointy end of the pointy end of the families that go to court for parenting matters. In 300 files of involving contravention applications, we found that more than 90% of matters involved allegations of family violence and child abuse, with children directly involved in most cases. 55% of those matters involved cross allegations, uh, meaning that each party had made allegations against each other in relation to family violence. More than a quarter of the files had a history of cha state child protection system engagement. Half of all the matters had a current or past personal protection order on file, with mothers being the protected party in 79% of cases. One third of that sample of matters had had more than five years in the court from the start of the parenting matter. So that is a, a very graphic example of the way that our systems intersect and our families using these systems often need to engage with multiple systems. So that's the topic of the, of the uh, webinar today. So we have Lisa speaking about the Family Court and the Lighthouse Project, uh, which is an attempt, um, a very important um, measure to better meet the needs of families affected by family violence in the Family Court um, and its use of uh, risk screening. Daryl comes from a child, perspective, a, a child protection perspective and highlights investigation of safety and parenting capacity as an issue relating to the gap between the family law and child protection systems. Anne highlights barriers for families trying to access services and how failings in systems like health and mental health lead to increased pressure on the child protection system. Jess describes 
some of the experiences she has heard about families involved in the family court system. We're now going to look at the part of the panel uh, from the conference. I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. So the Lighthouse Project um, has been piloted in three sites, Brisbane, Adelaide and Parramatta, and is soon to be rolled out to 12 other registries. Um, it uses risk screening, um, which parents can complete um, on a, via an online application at the time of filing a parenting only application um, to find the most appropriate case management pathway for the case. So it uses um, a traffic light type system of high, medium and low um, to decide which is the most um, appropriate case management pathway. So this is quite different for our court because in the past, as you know, people filed and you were on the same sort of traje trajectory regardless of um, what the level of risk was in your case. So screening is voluntary. voluntary. Um, some people might not feel safe to disclose, um, but if there are many prompts to try and uh, encourage people to complete that screen, the Family Law Act was amended to make risk screening confidential and inadmissible, meaning it can't be used in the proceedings because we wanted people to feel safe to disclose um, information in the risk screen without the fear that that would be used against them. So just in terms of um, the numbers um, involved, 60% of cases screen high um, about 17% medium, and it's important to say they can still be very high risk cases, and 23% screen low. So the low risk um, cases are referred to early dispute resolution because we want those people to have an opportunity to resolve their issues and move out of the system before their issues escalate. Um, we've learnt a lot about our litigant population through this project. Um, because that screening is confidential and inadmissible, we capture more information which can be used in court through the notice of child abuse, family violence and risk. And that, that's where people are disclosing themselves what sort of risks um, their children and they are experiencing. And I thought you might be interested in that. So during a one year period, 18,300 notices were filed. 54% of parties said um, a child had been abused or was at risk of abuse. 64% of parties said that they had experienced family violence. 57% of parties said that their children had experienced family violence. 39% said that drugs, alcohol or substance misuse was an issue. 40% said that there were mental health issues which um, could cause harm to a child. 26% said the child was at risk of being abducted and 14% that said that there'd been a recent threat to, um, to harm a child. So of those 60% of cases um, in that highest risk category, um, they have four or more risks. So we're talking about families with very complex needs. Um, those families are placed on a special list called the Evett list. Um, and really carefully case managed to try and um, make sure that we have the information that we need from the police, from the Child Welfare Authority, from um, subpoenas, because what we're trying to do is to allocate the resources based on the level of risk in the case. So these are the cases where an ICL will be ordered, where there'll be a child impact report um, and we'll have involvement from the Child Welfare Authority and the police get information through Section 69ZW or where it's really urgent, we can arrange for um, a representative from the Child Welfare Authority, so that's the co-located worker, to actually come into the court and provide us with a summary. And that's really important because in our court, there are often those contested allegations of violence. So each parent saying that they've, they've experienced violence from the other parent. 
what we're trying to do is understand the dynamic in the family to understand who's the most in need of protection. And those records from the police and the Child Welfare Authority can be really, really helpful in understanding the family's history and the needs of those children. Thank you, Lisa. Really interesting to, to hear about the, the developments in the courts, Lisa. Um, and Daryl, I know that you've had a significant interest over many years in relation to interfaces, overlaps and gaps in systems. Um, so I'm just interested to hear um, your thoughts on the challenges and whether you're aware of any solutions that are emerging at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, and as you know, we wrote together um, about mind the gap, the fact that there is some really significant <laughs> gaps in the, the systems between family law and child protection. I mean, my background, I'm, you know, I haven't come from a family law background. I'm mainly child abuse and neglect, child protection. And having worked for a number of years at the Australian Institute of Family Studies, where there's a strong focus around you know, family law issues, understanding the complexity and the, um, the ways in which those systems both intersect, but also the, how there are gaps remaining, was shocking to me. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest gaps that even though there is overlapping responsibilities and what seems like, you know, overlapping um, desire to be able to identify risk and to be able to ensure the safety of children, certainly, you know, the legislative obligation, the responsibility of both of those systems require that, there's still some major gaps. And the gap that I really see is about investigation. Um, that the responsibility of state child protection departments, you know, is to respond largely to mandatory reports, you know, about risk of harm. And many of the circumstances that come to the attention of a family court don't meet the threshold. Um, so even if they are investigated, it's not substantiated, often because of incredibly high workloads with the statutory child protection departments, it doesn't even get <coughs> investigated. Um, and so there's a range of different kind of systems for dealing with this. I was involved with evaluating Magellan, which was a case listing model within the family court to deal with sexual abuse and serious physical abuse cases. But there's a whole range of, of problems that it was trying to solve, um, made some headway towards that, but I think still remain. Um, clearly, and, and Lisa, I think it raises, goes to the issue that you raised about the, um, I don't know if it's called Form 4, but that, that form, the, the notification of risk. Um, that often parties, you know, parents who are separated and, and arguing over, you know, where children can um, be cared for safely, um, don't necessarily clearly identify the full range of harms or in fact raise it at all. And it's hard to know whether that's because parents are deliberately holding back, whether they're fearful, or in fact whether they're not being well advised from their lawyers around what their responsibilities are. So there's a gap from that system perspective in even knowing what the concerns are. Then, from the other side, the, um, the Magellan model was trying to bring forward those um, investigations so that state and territory child protection departments would agree, even though it looked like it wouldn't necessarily meet their criteria, to conduct an investigation. Um, most cases that are going through the court system, though, don't end up in the Magellan listing, even if they involve um, child abuse allegations. So most are going through you know, the, the Federal Circuit Court um, or not being listed in that, partly because that notice of risk doesn't necessarily flag early on that this is actually a key feature of the, of the case. But coming to the biggest gap that I, I wanted to kind of put out there, and I'd love to hear from my colleagues here whether they think this is even sensible, um, is that we don't have an independent system that actually measures capability um, of parents, who is able to, um, you know, do a good job of parenting and care safely for their children. Um, child protection departments, that's not their responsibility. They're saying, do you meet the criteria for effectively child removal? That's the end point of, uh, you know, a child protection investigation. There might be a number of stages along the way to try and keep children safe, such as, you know, referring to a parenting program, etc. But you know, if you're substantiating harm and the harm is high risk enough, then you know, the, the um, tool that a child protection department has is to remove. 
Um, so the skill set and the orientation of child protection workers is not to be doing a broad scale evaluation of parenting styles, parenting capacity, who's able to be most responsive to children. Are both parents capable of doing that? Or under what circumstances might there be some concerns in the context of uh, parents who might be separating? And similarly, I think family court systems don't really have that in-depth capability of, of doing it. Although I think, you know, Lisa, from what you're saying, there's some moves towards that with the, the kind of um, pilots that you're talking about. But to me, the big gap is an independent system of both of those two structural systems of the family court system and the child protection system where you can go to have an independent um, uh, parenting assessment. It kind of sounds a little bit like the, um, you know, the family relationship centres as they were originally envisaged. Mm. Thank you, Daryl. Systems. Let me just say a little bit, if I might, about systems change, simply because often these terms are used and not, not well defined. And I, so what I would call a system is the laws, policies, practices, people, values, power structures, and importantly, the money that determine how things get done. And education is an example of a system that's meant to meet the community's needs for education, child development and training at the tertiary level. By the way, really good example this morning of a big systems change moment when you've got big states of New South Wales and Victoria jointly saying they're going to do something quite remarkable mm. in the preschool years. Watch that space. That, so that's an example of a systems change moment uh, that you don't see very often. So these are so that, so we have all these systems that don't work well together. Of course, we have the justice system, which includes the family law system, and then there's the child protection system. That's the one that's meant to step in when the other systems have failed to keep children safe. And of course, we know the child protection system is chronically overwhelmed because the it's the failure of the other systems, health, education social services, etc. Um, upstream, they're failing. So you basically end up downstream at the end with the child protection system. Um, domestic and family violence, mental ill health, basic needs like income security and affordable housing. These are the issues that kids and families tell us about when we bother to ask them. These are the barriers to keeping, for keeping children safe and well. Right? The basic systems that are meant to be looking after all of us are failing the kids and families who are living with the most disadvantage. System change involves recognising that children and their families don't live in one policy silo. Our lives are complex and we all need these systems to work well together and to be coordinated. And the more complex our needs are, the more the fragmentation of systems are failing us. Most of us manage fine to navigate them when things are going okay. But once you start to pile on a few issues in your family, you find these systems are broken. The more needs you have, the more evident that the systems are not designed to meet our needs as the consumer. Their designed, their design principles are based on other criteria. And if you're living with poverty, disadvantage, disability or other special needs, these systems are not working for you. So we need to start listening to kids and families. We need to address those elements I listed before, like the power structures, the values that under, underpin uh, the systems. We need to examine ourselves and our own beliefs and behaviour because it's entirely possible that the way we're behaving is inadvertently helping to keep things the same. However, and this, and I'll finish up on this, Ray, child safety and well-being is not a system. It's an objective. It's a value. It's our responsibility under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and child safety and well-being should be our national priority, but it's not. Yeah. All policy and service systems should have child safety and well-being as a core objective that they're accountable for. And this includes systems primarily focused on adults, such as domestic and family violence, adult mental health, drug and alcohol, justice and prisons. These systems, they need to 
at least know their clients are parents. We don't count them when they're in prison as parents. They need to recognise and support them with their parenting responsibilities. The job of protecting children is not the job of the child protection system alone. The evidence is clear. There'll never be enough ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. I was one of those child protection frontline workers early, right at the start of my career. And I can tell you the amount of change in 40 years is minuscule. If anything, it's the job has just got harder. So, of course, we need change within that child protection system. We can talk about that if we want. But none of that change, you know, the workforce development, the applying the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principles, the, the um, getting the workers away from their desks and out into the field, none of that's going to be enough because the child protection system alone cannot keep kids safe. That's why talking about the intersection of the systems is where the conversation needs to go. The core system's failure is the fact that child safety is siloed there and we're not listening to kids and families about the upstream form to those systems where most of our money goes, health and education in particular. That's where we need, that's what innovation should look like. That's what reform should look like, upstream. Uh, and we should stop tinkering around the edges. I call it managerialism, not leadership, where we're just looking at the symptoms of stuff, we're not getting to the underlying drivers and causes. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anne. Um... Very, very powerful points you make there. Uh, so Jess, you've spoken to a lot of victim survivors um, in your work as a journalist investigating family and domestic violence. Uh, what do you hear from those women, primarily, um, about how the system, the systems meet or don't meet their needs? Um, so predominantly, I hear from parents and grandparents and extended relatives who are desperate almost to the point of insanity. Um, they contact me daily asking for advice on how to get a lawyer who will listen to them, what they can do about a family report that's just wrongly diagnosed them as having borderline, what they can do about the fact that because they brought child sexual abuse allegations to the family court, they're about to have contact removed. Um, it's, I remember when I spoke to Rosie Batty for the first time in 2015, uh, she said to me, if it weren't for the family court, I almost would not get contacted by victim survivors. And um, I kind of know what she means by that now. <laughs> um, because I'd say, yeah, 60 to 70% of my contacts are about family court. Um, and the fact that they're contacting me as a journalist is shows you how dire the need is and how you know how little services there are um, that are adequate to meet their needs so the thing for me i guess is that we have a court system that has evolved uh, particularly over the last 20 years to be decidedly pro-contact helen rhodes has written so well about this um, it's a culture that is replicated in many international jurisdictions, including the UK, where there is a very um, hot conversation going on at the moment about that culture and how dangerous it is for children. So we have a pro-contact court, and yet we have a court for which the majority of cases involve at least allegations of family violence. So we have a court that is a frontline child protection response service that is pro-contact. So let's just wrap our heads around how that works for, as a paradigm. Um, Laurie Maloney's in the, in the audience today and um, I just want to credit him for an incredible study that um, he and her colleagues did last year on uh, allegations of child sexual abuse uh, that were put in front of the court. Um, now they found that 86% of child sex abuse allegations, um, I think between 2012 and 2019, um, were unfounded by a judge. Two thirds, in two thirds of those cases, the um, care was increased with the allegedly unsafe parent 
and in 17% of the cases, the contact was switched entirely so the, um, to the allegedly unsafe parent. There have been amazing improvements. The Lighthouse Project is an incredible improvement. Um, the training with the Safe and Together Institute, which is, I think, one of the best educational teams in the world, is an amazing improvement. Mapping of perpetrator patterns and impact on children and families is such a great improvement. But we are dealing with this in this slow motion way and it is an urgent problem. This is not something that, you know, an attorney general can just um, make a, um, a nice piece of reform to leave a legacy. This is something that is the attorney general should feel is, a, is an absolute matter of compelling urgency. I hope you enjoyed uh, hearing those uh, parts of our very interesting and important panel discussion from the conference. We're now turning to uh, questions from listeners. Uh, some of these questions were provided uh, by registrants before the webinar and some of them are live. I'm um, interested to know, perhaps Jess, you might have a, a response to this question. Um, from one of our audience members. Um, what do you think about including parents more in conversations about child safety and wellbeing and <laughs> systems to support children to stay with their family? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a it's a tricky one for me because where I come <laughs> to the family space is through the prism of family violence um, and and particularly where there's been um, situations either of coercive control um, or or uh, and or direct physical or sexual abuse of the children. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure I fully understand the the scope of the question um, in terms of like talking more to parents about. Um, about the upbringing of the children, but but I guess the what it brings up for me is this this notion of equal shared parental responsibility, um, which is obviously at the moment you know a, a core function of the court, obviously much disputed from various angles. But if we're to really take that seriously, what what is equal shared parental responsibility, and and actually having things in in place to um, to monitor that or to get some feedback on whether that equal shared parental responsibility is actually um, the case where, where that is ordered or whether um, it's it's just something that's being used as a mechanism of control by one parent um, and, and, and that, that what they have been ordered into by the courts is not actually being lived up to. Um, because I think if we were to, if we were to truly have a way of monitoring equal shared parental responsibility and making sure that was the case um, for kids who end up with those orders um, to, to have that with both parents. Um, maybe we would actually have much better outcomes um, instead of just having equal shared parental responsibility ordered um, and there being, you know, practically no no mode of review aside from an appeal um, or, or some, you know, um, effort to vary orders. There's no way to actually review whether that is working um, um, and and how how it is affecting the children um, and and how shared the parenting is in reality. Okay, thanks, Jess. Uh, can I, Daryl? You're waving. Uh, we, we got you back online with yeah. sound. Yes, I think so. Sorry about that. Look, can I just jump in on um, one of the things Jess is saying about um, the involvement of family? And I and I agree, but I think um, taking a child-centred approach to that question is really important. And I think that's one of the things that I was highlighting before in terms of the gap that's missing is an investigative kind of function that is actually able to take a child-centred approach. And one of the challenges is that um, the family law system is, um, is private law. So it's two parties that have a, a dispute. So there is no sort of independent arbiter that's coming in. They have to rely on, the two parties have to rely on evidence from outside. So that could be evidence from a child protection department. But as we've already pointed out, few of the um, uh, you know, allegations are actually appropriately tested 
in that um, forum. So how do we actually hear the voice of children about where they're going to be safe and how they are going to best be parented? And I think that in, you know, in some instances, in many instances, having continued contact and, and shared responsibility is appropriate and what is in children's best interest. But in other instances, it is clearly not. And how do we differentiate that at the moment? I don't think we have a reliable system to actually provide that investigation and to do it in a, you know, a gentle and child centred way. Um, Interestingly, you know, in places like the US, they've got a much more robust system of, uh, of what's called children's advocacy centres, which I don't think um, connect up with the family law system as we're, you know, kind of hoping that it might do, um, but it's really about the interface between the criminal justice system and, um, and the child protection system, so that police and, uh, and, and child protection workers are, are able to have, you know, concerns about children investigated. Um, but that's, that's, I suppose, my big concern is that we often miss the point that it's a private law you know, matter between two parties who can't agree. And that's fundamentally going to be problematic when we're focusing on the, the well-being of children and their safety. Mm. Thank you, Daryl. Um, they're very interesting thoughts. And of course, our uh, I think our thinking has got very sophisticated in the last few years about child participation uh, in some areas, but possibly practice has yet to catch up. Uh, mm. Lisa, are you back online? I, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, Lisa. So that's wonderful. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, so okay. I'll, just, I'll just refresh Sorry. your memory on that question that was asked about how child protection and the family court communicate now um, and, you know, what the interface there. And, you know, of course, you may wish to refer to the co-located child protection pilot. All right, so there are two main ways that the court provides information to the Child Welfare Authority and obtains information from it. So the no Notice of Child Abuse, Family Violence and Risk, which every parent now has to complete when they file a parenting application, whether it's in Division 1 or Division 2, seeks information about family violence and child abuse. If there are allegations of child abuse or serious family violence, those um, notices are referred to the Child Welfare Authority so that it can make its investigations. And if I can just respond to the excellent point that Daryl made about the differences between Australian and American law, without boring everyone with a constitutional le lecture, the Commonwealth's responsible for family law States are responsible for the services like child protection, police and hospitals. So the sort of places that hold really important information about the welfare of children. Child welfare authorities are responsible for investigating allegations, whereas the court adjudicates disputes between parents, as Darren said. So the other thing that can happen is that the court can make a request to a child welfare authority to intervene in the proceedings pursuant to section 91B of the Family Law Act, but that's something that doesn't commonly occur. So the way that we try to have, or the Commonwealth has tried to bridge that gap is through these co-located workers who are actually present in court. And it was intended that the information go both ways. So they're providing information to the court to assist judicial officers to make decisions about the best interests of children, but they're receiving information back that they might not have to help them. And the court often facilitates that understanding by providing the department with material provided in the court, whether it's affidavits, family reports, other reports to help them make an assessment um, in their own investigations. And I think um, what's happened since co-location is that two-way flow has really improved. Probably both the state and um, federal family court's ability to make better in-time decisions about children. Thank you, Lisa. Now that's a pilot. Are you able to tell us whether a decision has been made about rolling that out? 
Yeah, so the pilot has, uh, so it has been extended. The Commonwealth um, in the last budget did provide extra um, funding to extend that. Um, and so we're very pleased about that because it's something that really does assist the judges to make better in time decisions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think that is one of the very important initiatives that we've seen um, implemented along with Lighthouse in, in recent years. Now, I understand that Anne um, is not visible, but she is audible. So Anne, I would just like to invite you, if you can hear us, and I'm hoping you can, uh, to pick up on the point that Daryl raised about child participation. Um, this is very much under your jurisdiction. Uh, so I think your, our audience would be very interested to hear your thoughts on that topic. So can you hear me, Ray? Yes, I can, Anne. Excellent. It's, it seems we've broken the internet here today <laughs> because um, some of us can only have one form of um, communication and uh, it seems I lost my camera. Um, look, I think uh, the the whole issue of child participation is, um, is, is growing strongly in this country. We certainly are seeing uh, many organisations uh, trying to include children and young people much more in the governance of the organisations and in the development of policies and procedures in, and design of services um, that are meant to help them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not always doing it perfectly, but there is certainly uh, an interest in engaging more with kids. And this is a great thing because, of course, it is uh, they're right under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, Article 12, that children do, uh, that children's voices are heard and that, that we give um, due weight to what they have to say. Now, of course, when it comes to something like the family court, it's, uh, it's a whole lot more complex. Uh, we've got a whole lot more, I guess, um, legal history behind the way that the family court operates. And, uh, and but I, I think that we've, we've got, the family court itself and the family law system are ripe for being influenced as well by the fact that we now know, really since the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, we know that children who are silenced are not protected. So we, we need to find ways of allowing kids to safely participate in matters that uh, have huge implications on their immediate li daily lives, but of course their long-term futures. And I'm very, um, I'm very encouraged by the fact that that um, uh, that the family law system is really trying to take this on in many different ways. And, uh, and of course, if you were to ask kids, then of course they would say the the that we're focusing on today need to be connected because that's where their lives um, are lived across those systems, not just one. Thank you, Anne. Um, that's, um, that is really um, very significant information and thinking there. Uh, now, one of our audience, Lisa, I think has a question for you. Uh, and they're wondering, I'm pretty sure this is about the, the Lighthouse project. Um, they would like to understand how ongoing case man management works once a case is considered high risk. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the first thing to understand is that the case management starts from the moment the cases are identified or placed on the list, which is after the litigant list um, risk screens and before the first court date. So from that moment, the Evett Registrar starts making case management decisions such as the filing and service of the material, requesting that legal aid appoint an independent children's lawyer, um, setting a date for a child impact report. All these things are done before the first court date because the intention is that, that we want these cases to have every um, court event as a meaningful one so that um, people don't just come along to court and get sent away so that directions can get made. After the interim hearing, which is that first date in court, and by that time we have a lot of information from the 
the Child Welfare Authority, from the Child Impact Report, from the information provided by the parents, from the independent children's lawyer and subpoenas, um, an interim order is made and then um, usually the next court event, um, sometimes it's a mention because we need to see what's happening or obtain some more information or obtain a family report but usually the next court event is the trial directions and uh, then a trial compliance check and a trial. So what we're trying to do with these high risk matters is really support the families through the court system until the end of the case. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm sure the audience is finding that, um, that very detailed insight that you're able to provide really, really useful. Uh, and Jess, one of our um, audience members has asked uh, how lawyers can help clients that are victims of domestic violence. What have you heard from the people that you've spoken to about what is and isn't good legal practice in this context? Well, there's still um, a real hangover from the uh, days of friendly parent provisions um, in that lawyers um, are routinely, it seems, advising um, their clients not to bring up allegations of abuse. I mean, this was documented, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a routine issue in the reports that preceded the 2012 reforms. Um, and, and still, I hear the same thing. Um, or they are are limiting their descriptions in affidavits of um, of the environment in the relationship and the family to um, to incidents of violence, of physical violence um, predominantly, but not able to because they don't have the nous um, to actually describe in the affidavit the environment of coercive control. Um, and not only how it affects the intimate partner, but how children um, were the secondary targets and secondary victims of that control. So I think that, you know, it's it's difficult. We're dealing in chronologies um, in the family court and, and often in the criminal courts as well. Um, and we're trying to adapt a, a system that is unrelenting and, and not incident based into a sort of date and time chronology, um, which is which is very difficult. Um, but primarily what lawyers can do to, to help their clients is to become, become educated on their core business um, and to recognise that if you are a family lawyer, you are working in a court whose predominant role is um, child protection and for whom the vast majority of clients will be bringing allegations of abuse. Um, if the first thing to realise as a family lawyer is that if you do not have specialist understanding of family violence and of coercive control and of the intersections between that and, um, and more direct forms of child sex abuse and physical abuse, um, you will get it wrong. And I say that from personal experience, um, from um, from now eight years of uh, writing and researching about this obsessively and still learning about ways in which I'm getting it wrong. Um, uh, after doing a documentary, an audio series, a book and um, 300 speaking engagements on the topic. So um, if you think that, you know, two hours is enough to get across this brief, I just want to disavow you of that notion. <laughs> And, and and also to say that if you're I mean, not just lawyers but mediators, family dispute resolution practitioners, um, there is obviously education on this topic is coming into vogue um, and being seen as something that's increasingly mandatory for you to be able to do your work. Um, there are a lot of people offering this type of education who aren't necessarily qualified to give it um, and who may actually be um, creating more problems for you in your profession by, by giving you wrong-headed education than, than what you had before. And so I'd just be very careful about who you go to for education um, and, and, and looking, for, um, looking for trainers that have some accreditation or have some runs on the board, not just random um, education bodies. Um, but recognise that this is your core business. 
Um, and I mean, really, this this should not be on individual lawyers. It should be a core part of what um, what you need to study as a family lawyer to become accredited. Um, it should not be just a um, something you take up as a matter of interest. Mm. Very, um, very interesting points. And of course, we've had many inquiries that have uh, called for uh, education in relation to domestic and family violence for all players in the system, uh, not only lawyers. Now, our, our audience seems quite engaged with the question of child participation. And um, there is a question that goes to uh, the possibility of a direct instructions model for children in the family law system. And so I'd like uh, Daryl and Anne to share responses to that, because of course, currently what we have uh, is a model where independent children's lawyers, where they are appointed, and it's not all cases, uh, are obligated to act in the best interests of the child. Uh, rather than acting on a direct instructions basis. Daryl, I might ask you first. Yeah, thanks, Ray. And look, I, I think it goes back to the kind of broader theme that we were alluding to before, that really family law disputes are disputes between two parties. And maybe we've got a fundamental problem with our system when in fact we should be thinking about three parties. There's, you know, the two parents and then there's the child or, or children. And how do we, accurately um, present their, not only their views, but um, what, what are the ways in which we can keep them safe? Because of course there are some children who would be too young to be able to be involved in a direct instruction, i.e. where the, you know, the child is instructing the you know, solicitor as to her or his or their views. Um, about that many children wouldn't want to be in that process. So I think we have to recognise that any system that was to include direct instruction would be um, not well serving some children. You know, it could be children who are pre-verbal, ch children with disability, um, or, or children who feel really caught, who love both parents, but recognise that there are um, uh, inadequacies, but perhaps on, on both sides. And so that's why I think we actually have to, um, you know, take out the, the 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 kind of process of hearing the voice of children away from the court system, which is um, unfortunately adversarial, um, where where you've got two parties at war with each other. That's not a good place for children to be, um, you know, the 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 kind of um, you know the meat in the sandwich, for want of a better term. We really need to um, have a more preventive system that could, as part of its function, um, be doing these kind of assessments and, and hearing in a, a much calmer and less adversarial way um, what children um, see and hear and what is going to be in their best interests. And so that's why I would advocate for a new independent system that could feed into both the statutory child protection systems in each of the states and territories, as Lisa pointed out, but also into um, family law um, decision making. Thank you, Daryl. Mm. Uh, very nuanced answer there. Uh, Anne, what would you, uh, what would your response to be to the issue of whether we need a direct instructions model in family law? Well, I'll answer this as a non-lawyer, because uh, I think lawyers come at this from a very different perspective. But um, I, I'd say firstly that I think most people who haven't been involved in the family law system, when they hear the term independent children's lawyer, would think that's what the lawyer's doing, is representing the child. Uh, so, you know, there are nuances here that those of us who sort of work in the system, we take for granted. That is not a given for you know anyone else who's never had anything to do with the system i think that tells us a lot about you know i guess to what extent the public might have an investment in understanding and even in in thinking about reform in this because of course we also know that the family law system is the part of law that most people will have something to do with across their lives more than any other aspect of the justice system. So, you know, that, that basic misunderstanding, and there are many others, of course, but that, that misunderstanding, I think, is quite an interesting one. Just a couple of things to add to what Daryl says. Um, I, think, I think that it is worth looking at uh, 
law reform in this area, but I, I'm saying this as a non-lawyer. <laughs> so, you know, I understand that it's complex, but it seems to me that the more entrenched the dispute between the parents is, and we know that there are some really, you know, issues that, the disputes that go on, it seems for generations actually, well, not quite generations, but for, for in fact, the whole of the child, childhood of the child, the more entrenched the dispute, the more important it is for us to look at some form of direct representation because uh, really this the Family Law Act is kind of designed for the adults. It's, it's like all other policy is really written for adults. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, somehow we need to elevate child safety and wellbeing. Somehow we need to, you know, have that cut through whatever the adults in the, you know, whether, the, whether it's the parents, the judges, the lawyers, or everyone has their own set of interests in this. How how can we make child safety and well-being the absolute prime matter uh, to to be addressed? Whatever it takes to make sure we do that, uh, that we elevate child safety and well-being. Uh, I would I, I would think it would be worth having a look at that closely. Can I Thank just make you, one Anne. point also? Yep. In, in, yes, you know, to what Anne and Daryl have said, um, and that is that. We need to be really aware that like the, the family court, while yes, there are high conflict families and there are, you know, disputes that are that are you come out of, of, of a conflicted relationship, there are also perpetrators of coercive control uh, uh, who are abusive, who may be um, also child sex offenders, who are also in the courts and they are using the courts um, as a way to exert greater power and control over their victims um, and their children. Um, what we don't have enough of is um, training and education for the parts of the court that are coming into direct contact with both parents on how to avoid collusion. You know, these are highly manipulative offenders um, I think I mentioned, not, it wasn't on the recording, but um, at the seminar that one American cop put it that like he's never been persuaded by a bank robber to arrest the clerk. And yet that is what happens on a regular basis with perpetrators of coercive control and family violence and, and perpetrators of child sexual abuse. Um, over and over and over I hear from um, protective parents that the independent children's lawyer has been colluding with the perpetrator of violence, has become very um, much a representative of theirs um, to the point where they seem to disregard um, what the children are asking for or talking about or their views. And we saw this in the Jack and Jennifer Edwards case with incredibly tragic results. Um, that the the case of that ICL which which drew national attention that wasn't an outlier or a bad apple that was a systemic issue um, and if we do not have education on how to resist collusion which you know men's behaviour change program facilitators will tell you is a very difficult thing to do um, if you don't have education and training on that the chance that you will become their representative and not the child's representative um, is extremely high um, and they will go to great lengths to persuade you that their ex-partner has personality disorders and, and, in, and is in fact the perpetrator, such that we, we have an acronym that describes that process. It's DAVO, Deny, Attack and Reverse Victim and Offender. That is happening writ large across the family courts and I don't think that the family courts are set up to resist that and are, and are at the moment being taken advantage of reasonably easily. Okay. By can I step yep. in because I've listened yep. to a lot and I think I think it's really important that this not be a forum to perpetuate some myths. So the first thing I want to say is that Jess makes a really good point. The family court is a place that there is the potential for systems misuse and we know that perpetrators do that in a variety of ways. From the one that she just referred to which is denying um, our, you know, I've read many affidavits where where um, someone who's actually a respondent to an order will say, I'm the victim of coercive controlling violence, etc. So we know that happens. And the other opportunity for systems misuse is to delay the proceedings, increase the other person's um, costs, 
um, not comply with orders. We know that all these things happen. The court's really acutely aware of that. And a lot of the work we've been doing in the last few years is to try and reduce the opportunity for that. So when we designed the Triple P um, property program, that was designed with this careful case management to try and reduce that. Likewise, when the Everett list was designed, it was designed to try and reduce that. So it, it wouldn't be accurate to say that the court's got no awareness or understanding of this at all. Do I think that we always get it right? No, we don't because this can be a very confusing dynamic to understand and it can take, take time to understand it. Okay. But it's certainly something we are trying to do better at and we'll keep trying to do better at. With respect to children and their voices, in, we, it's not true to say that we don't listen to children um, or that their views aren't given weight. These are complex and nuanced issues and there are many, many variations on Thank you so much for that discussion, Lisa. Um, thank you for all of your contributions um, to our four panellists. Uh, we're very, very grateful that you uh, agreed to extend uh, your engagement with this topic, with this webinar. Very important material has been discussed. Thank you so much to our audience um, for attending, listening, for asking questions and for the important work that you do uh, with children and families. And thank you, panellists. And if there were unlimited resources and cross-government support, uh, what would the so solution to this fragmented system look like? <laughs> oh, the magic wand question, right? So, yep. um, well, look, I think, I think we need to understand that the basic premise that any of these systems should operate separately is clearly misguided. I think that's what we've all been saying. Uh, and that's because children and young people and their families do not live in one silo, one system. You know, our lives are complex. And uh, essentially what we have in, in our society is investments in a range of systems that are designed to um, help us to improve our lives, to keep us safe, to uh, help address the problems that we might experience throughout our lives. And complex human needs really require all of these systems to operate in seamless alignment as much as possible. So that to me is the sort of the vision that we, 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 we recognise the need for systems reform and that we do it with children at the centre of our, our focus, that it's uh, that, that, that child safety and wellbeing should be elevated as the main aim. So whatever we need to do, whatever it is we need to do to our laws, to our policy and service systems to ensure that children are safe and that their wellbeing is prioritised across this country that's what we should be doing. So I think in a way we need a guiding star. We need, you know, because we tend to do this tinkering with, oh, we'll just sort of fix this little bit of, you know, because of this system popping, symptom, sorry, popping up over here. Let's let's fix that or, or um, you know, let, let's just do a bit of fine tuning or, you know, around the edges of things. We're not really getting at the core uh, I think we need to kind of go a bit deeper and go perhaps even, you know, that idea of working, looking at a blank sheet of paper and going, if we had a blank sheet of paper, how would we build a family law system, for example? And yeah. I think in the light of all the evidence from the last few decades, in the light of all the things this panel has said, in light of all the things we now know, um, we would not build the family law system the way we have, the way it is now. So the question is, do we just tinker with it or do we have actually look at a, um, a fundamental redesign that is a better fit 
for the children and their families uh, based on the, the knowledge we have to date. It sound, this, look, this sounds big and scary, but I actually think that we're at a time in our history and social policy where this is what's going to be required on a number of levels. I think it's true for the education system, which in many ways is not fit for purpose for many of our most disadvantaged kids. Um, it's true in the health system. So all of these systems, I think, require some degree of basic redesign and ins ensuring that they're working well together to address the, uh, the complex needs that people have and to actually arrest the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, progression into those complex responses of child protection, the expensive responses of child protection, youth justice, the criminal justice system generally, homeless, the cost of homelessness, mental health issues and so forth. We need to do some redesign work to, to stop that, um, those costs escalating. Thank you, Anne. Love that big just, picture thinking. It's simple, really. <laughs> Very easy. The ALRC just said devolve the um, jur the family law jurisdiction back to the states. So um, there are some interesting um, ideas out there. Uh, Daryl, what would be your solution to the problem? Yeah, well, as, as you just mentioned, Ray, I think one of the things is we need to look at the suggestions for reform that have already occurred. Uh, already been made, such as the um, recommendations of the um, ALRC. Why are we not implementing that? We've also got mechanisms for having systems review um, across government, um, such as the Safe and Supported National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children. But unfortunately, it's really child protection departments talking to child protection departments. It's not got representation from other areas of government, um, such as attorneys general. Um, and so we're not going to have the interface between child protection and systems like family law uh, dealt with in a, a, a forum like the, the national framework, despite its, um, you know, its, its objective of being about addressing harm to children and turning around the problem of child abuse and neglect, clearly we see in the data from the family law system that it remains a significant issue that is being unaddressed by the, the, the reforms that, um, that have been implemented at the state and territory level. So I, I would absolutely say we have to go back to some of those fundamental um, reform recommendations from um, at the ALRC. Thank you, Daryl. And um, conveniently, we have another question that is aimed at you, and it's probably the last one we have time for. Uh, so this questioner would like to know um, how investigation of child protection concerns occurs across systems. Um, for example, including conversations between police, mental health and child protection. The problem of um, child protection investigations is that it's done under the legislative requirements of each state and territory. So it is slightly different. The grounds for intervention are slightly um, differently worded under each of the state and territory child protection laws. Um, and there are lots of um, mechanisms for the child protection workers and through the children's court or the youth courts in each of the different states and territories to bring forward evidence as they see fit. But the problem is that we don't actually have um, a, a, a coordinated system across those different um, jurisdictional responsibilities to hear in a consistent way what are the needs of children. And more importantly, there's absolutely no system for measuring what I would call parenting capacity. That's not part of the remit of child protection systems. And yet, of course, that's really the, the key question of the family law system is, uh, are both parties, you know, it's two private parties that are disputing where children um, should reside and how they should be cared for and how they can be kept safe. So uh, that's just not part of the remit of a child protection investigation. 
And I think that that's a problem. You know, we, we have other systems where we actually want to address the adequacy of somebody to do a particular thing. You know, we have a driver licence system to actually say, are you adequately able to get behind a powered vehicle and operate it safely? We don't have the same thing for, for parenting and we certainly don't have it at the point where um, there's problems and there's a dispute over who's able to safely care for and parent children. Thank you, Daryl. That's a very um, interesting idea, a, a licence to become a parent. <laughs> um, I think yeah. that's, uh, that's all we have time for. Um, Daryl and other panellists, thank you so much for your input. Mm -hmm.